Welcome to the Book of Life, a show about Jewish people and the books we read. I'm Heidi Estrin. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida. In this August 2006 episode of our podcast, we celebrate the power of storytelling. We'll hear from Sims Tabak, beloved author and illustrator of the classic Joseph Had a Little Overcoat, as well as the fun new book Kibitzers and Fools. Storyteller Karen Golden will talk about her storytelling CDs. And librarian Sharon Ellswit, author of The Jewish Story Finder, will tell us about her award-winning reference tool. Last up is Golly Cooks, director of the PJ Library, to tell us why she's sending free books to Jewish kids around the country. So settle back and get comfortable as we spin you some Jewish tales. Author and illustrator Sims Tabak has won many, many awards, including the Sidney Taylor Honor Award and the Caldecott Medal for Joseph Had a Little Overcoat, and another Sidney Taylor Honor for the more recent Kibitzers and Fools. Yiddish was his first language, and his love of Yiddishkeit shines through his work. We spoke to Sims by phone at his home in Willow, New York. Sims, tell us about Kibitzers and Fools. First, can you explain what a Kibitzer is? Basically, a kibitzer is a busybody, somebody who always gives advice that's not very good and that wasn't asked for in the first place. Originally, it was entitled Kibitzers and Schlamazels when I had first put it together, but the marketing department at Penguin thought that it was uh, too much of a Yiddish title, and so I changed Schlamazels to Fool. I wrote about 14 or 15 little stories, and they're mostly adaptations either of old stories that I've heard ever since I was a child, or some of them were even like a Jewish joke that I kind of embellished and made it more into a story. Your illustrations are so full of interesting details, like bits of newspaper, and I believe you sometimes appear in your own illustrations. Can you talk about how you create your pictures? When I did, there was an old lady that swallowed a fly using a die cut. I thought to myself, well, I have this hole in the book, and it's a little uncomfortable to have a hole cut out of a book. So I thought, what is it I could put in there to sort of make it seem that the hole itself is a little more comfortable as a graphic element? So it was at that point that I decided to use collage, which I had never actually done before, and cut out little other kinds of graphic elements so that the die cut in the book would look more comfortable. In Joseph, I was able to take elements out of my own background and use them. And since the book was such a personal book for me, because it was based on a song that I had heard when I was a very young child, I decided to use little details about my family. Picture where Joseph goes to see his married sister in the city. There's all these buildings in the back with open windows. Some of those little pictures are my daughter and my grandchildren and some close friends. I just love doing that. In one of the spreads, I have a book laying on a bench, and I thought, well, why can't that book be open to a story by Shalom Aleichem? Pictures on the wall, one of the pictures hanging there is Molly Pecan, who is a musical comedy star. I used a little old photo of my daughter Emily, which I doctored up a little bit and put a babushka on her face. There's also a postcard taped to the wall of a boat. The name of that boat I have on there is the Estonia. That was the name of the ship that my mother traveled to America in. Because of all these little bits and pieces of collage, the book became much more interesting for me to do. It sort of became little stories within stories. The whole thing became a lot of fun for me. Can you talk a little bit about the history of how Joseph Had a Little Overcoat came to be? Because this is a book that you wrote twice. I made uh, two different books out of the same story. In my career, I've been mostly a commercial illustrator. When things would get slow, I would sit down and think about what I could do either as a piece of promotion for myself or maybe some personal project. I always really was more interested in doing children's books than almost anything else. So I think it was around 1975, I remembered this 
song, Hub Ich Mir A Mantel, which is, I had a little overcoat. The song ends, so I lost the button, and so what did I have? So I sang a song about the whole thing. And this is the song I'm singing to you now. Being an artist, I just changed that and said, I made a book about it. And mm -hmm. so I show that in the last spread. I say, you can always make something out of nothing. You know, you can always get something out of uh, whatever experience happens to you. It's basically the creative experience. And it was only when I had the thing all put together that I realized that I could do it with a die cut and people could visually see the coat getting smaller and smaller. That was the first version. It did very poorly. Being that it was in 1975, it was an ethnic topic. The book was remaindered in, in about four months. But when I did There Was an Old Lady Who Swallowed a Fly, it had become a call to cut honor. Regina Hayes asked me, could I come up with another die-cut idea? Told her then that I had done this book 20 years before, and I would like to redo the whole book with new illustrations. Well, publishers don't like to redo books that are failures, and who can blame them? But she went along with it. So I didn't change any of the text on Joseph Had a Little Overcoat. I just redid the entire book with uh, new illustrations, uh, stronger, they're darker, they're more shtetl-like. Of course, I added all these little details, these all these little personal anecdotes and sayings and, and the new illustrations, and I think they look quite different. Can you sing a little bit of the song it's based on? Oh, yeah, I could sing it. Hab ich mir am Mantel um von Zeit in Stoff La 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 Hab ich mit in sich kein Ganzen in Stoff La 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 Darum hab ich mir betracht Und von dem Mann zu la Rechtu gemacht La 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 Von dem Mann well, that's just the first stanza, you know, where he has a coat, which is a mantle, mm -hmm. and then he turns it into a jacket, which is a record. Sims Tabak, thanks so much for speaking with us. Very welcome, Heidi. It was a pleasure. storyteller and musician who performs in front of live audiences around the country. Her stories have been included in anthologies and even on the Jewish public radio series One People, Many Stories. She has produced two CDs of stories, Tales and Scales, which won a National Parenting Publications Gold Award, and her newer CD, Pass It On, a journey through the Jewish holidays in story and song. We spoke to Karen by phone at her home in Los Angeles, California. Karen, how did you become a storyteller? It started about 17 years ago when I was doing a public radio show in Michigan, and I had a 15-minute show every day where I interviewed people in the community who had interesting jobs. So one day, I interviewed a storyteller, and I thought, that's a really interesting job, and I decided to begin pursuing my own storytelling career. Now, people can read stories similar to some of your stories in books. What is so special about actual storytelling? Storytelling, when you experience it live with a storyteller and an audience, always forms community. It always forms a bond. And the way that I do story storytelling, my stories are not set in stone. Usually, I don't even know what stories I'm going to be telling until I see my audience. And so there's very much a give and take between myself and my audience. So we all walk away with something new. And that's a wonderful thing for building a bond between people. In your recordings, there is quite a lot of music, and you're playing many of those instruments yourself. Which instruments do you play? I play the saxophone, accordion, ocarina, recorder. I also play the nose flute, uh, and of course, all the vocal sound effects are me. What is a nose flute? Oh, a nose flute is a little plastic instrument that you put up to your nose and you blow. 
like blowing your nose, only music comes out. <laughs> That's wonderful. Why do you choose to tell Jewish stories in particular? Those are the stories that are closest to my heart because family was very traditional and we grew up telling a lot of stories. And no matter how hard I try to tell stories from other cultures, and I do tell many stories from other cultures, they always come out sounding a little bit Jewish. Well, I grew up so very Jewish that it's, it's my heart and my soul. Your company is called Golden Button? Yes. Can you explain that name? Absolutely. It comes from the Yiddish word Golden Knopf, which was my last name before it became Golden. And I'll tell you the little story. If you'd like to hear the longer version of this story, it's actually the first story on my CD, Tales and Scales. My grandfather, when he came to America, his name was Tevya Goldenknopf, which means Golden Button. He was a tailor, and that's why he had that last name. And when he came to Ellis Island, the official sitting behind the desk said, Golden Knopf? Well, that's too long of a name for an American. And what is Knopf, anyway? You don't need it. In America, we have short names like Smith, Cohen, Green. So I'll cut the Knopf, which is the button off the Golden. And my grandfather became not just Kevy Golden, but Theodore Golden, which was his American name. And that's how we got our last name of Golden. But when trying to come up with a name for my company, I thought, well, Golden Knopf is kind of nice because that is my original last name. And so I added the Knopf, the button, back onto the Golden, and that became Golden Button. That's a wonderful story. Thank you. Golden. All his children became Goldens, and my name is Karen Golden. We never found either of those buttons again. But because of Tevye's American dream coat, we Goldens all have stories to tell, and we all have our own dreams to dream. Elswit has been a children's librarian for over 30 years. She became involved in storytelling through the 92nd Street Y, where she learned from master storyteller Panina Shram. This work led her to create the Jewish Story Finder, a guide to 363 tales, listing subjects and sources. She's the head librarian at Road of Shalom School in Manhattan, New York, where we spoke to her by phone. Sharon, tell us about the Jewish Story Finder. It grew from my own work as a librarian and a storyteller. I had come late to the world of Jewish folklore. Not until I was an adult uh, did I hear those stories about Alexander the Great in a Jewish story and Cinderella and magic mirrors and water palaces. And I even discovered that the story at the core of Tim Burton's Corpse Bride is Jewish, and it was called The Singer. But people didn't know these stories. They kept accessing the same few over and over again. And so I gathered... 363 different stories, which I liked and wanted to share with the Jewish world. That's what I set out to do with The Finder, to summarize one telling of a particular tale and then point the way to its variations. So who exactly is The Story Finder for? Storytellers, for librarians, for teachers, for parents who are interested in going to find these stories to share with their children. It is a reference book, and I was very humbled and delighted when The Story Finder received the Honor Award in Bibliography from the Research and Special Libraries Division of the Association of Jewish Libraries. Just to recognize it like that felt wonderful. How did you become involved in storytelling? Through the 92nd Street Y Storytelling Center. And over the years, Panina Shram showed me that letting go of the book can be a choice. You can let go and tell the story in your own words. And I tried it. There's a very dynamic contact when you tell a story. People are actively listening, and it requires something more from the listener. Sometimes it's the children who aren't even the best students who remember in fourth grade a story, the very first story that I told them in kindergarten. 
And along the way, I discovered that it isn't just children who enjoy listening to stories, that if you choose the right tale, there are haunting stories of betrayal and revenge and stories that are healing and comforting to adults, too. Storytelling is probably one of the earliest forms of human communication or entertainment. Why is it still important today? Since I knew that your program was going to be about stories, Mm -hmm. I looked up the word storytelling in my book, and there were so many different kinds of stories. There were stories where King Solomon told stories to see how people react and get at the truth. There's a story where a Holocaust survivor's ability to listen to the stories of others is the gift that helps them both to heal. There's a story where a lost princess remembers a story that her father told, which helps him to recognize her again. There's the story about Joseph the tailor, whose favorite blue coat through one mishap after another becomes the vest, the cap, the tie, the handkerchief, and a button. And when that button is lost, he has the story about it to tell. And then there's the very funny story where the rabbi teaches a gossip about the weight of her words by having her shake out a pillowcase of feathers and then see the impossibility of gathering them all up again. These are timeless. All of these themes are locked in to one place and can be told and heard again and again. Sharon, would you tell us a story? I was thinking about stories about storytelling, (laughs) and one of my favorites is Isaac Basheva Singer's version of uh, Shrewd Toady, who goes to borrow a silver soup spoon from Lizer, a wealthy man so miserly in his ways that he sits on a box to save furniture upholstery, and he eats dry bread with borscht when he's home. And Toadie swears to Liza that he's going to bring the silver spoon back the next day. And the following day, he does return. And not only does he bring back the one silver soup spoon that he borrows, but he has a little silver teaspoon that he gives to Liza to. He explains that the spoon gave birth. A week later, Toady comes to borrow another soup spoon from Liza, and Liza humps, but he gives him the spoon and says, of course, should another wonderful thing happen, I I know you'll do the right thing. And Toady returns this time with the one silver soup spoon and two silver teaspoons, and he says, twins. The spoon gave birth to twins. Following week, when Toadie has to borrow Liza's silver candlestick, he brings them right to the market, and he sells them for a lot of money. And this time, when Toadie returns to Liza, he's walking slowly, and he's empty-handed, and he says the candlesticks have died, and Liza is furious. He demands that they go to see the rabbi, who laughs, and he says that if Liza believed that a soup spoon could give birth, he must now accept that candlesticks can die. Sharon Ellswood, thank you so much for speaking with us. You're welcome, Heidi. I feel so passionately about the stories, and it's wonderful to be able to share it. Golly Cooks is the director of the PJ Library, a project of the Harold Greenspoon Foundation. The Foundation's mission is to enhance the vibrancy of Jewish life through education and experiences that impart the knowledge and values and joys of being Jewish. The PJ Library is one of their newest projects. We spoke to Golly about it by phone at her office in Springfield, Massachusetts. Golly, what exactly is the PJ Library? The PJ Library is a program that was started by Harold Grinspoon and the Harold Grinspoon Foundation. It sends for free, once a month, a Jewish children's book to families with children ages five and under. We became partners with the Imagination Library by Dolly Parton, and we sponsored the program here in Western Massachusetts. And since our foundation is very involved in Jewish continuity, Harold said, you know what, the Imagination Library structure, if we were to send a Jewish children's book, and we would be really promoting Jewish literacy. What does the PJ stand for? 
pajama. The PJ stands for pajama. What we really tried to do is create that image of that really special time, you know, right before bedtime when after a bath, so they're snuggled in their PJs and it's time for a story. And so we really wanted to capture that spirit in the books that we send out and hope to make these really special moments into Jewish moments. Why are books and stories a good way to help families connect with Judaism? Books last a lifetime. There's so many people that have said, oh, yeah, that children's book, I've had it since my mother read it to me at three years old, and I have it here in my new home, and I'm reading it to my child. And it's a beautiful linking point of past, present, future. And the books are so wonderful. They just communicate such beautiful values and information in ways that are creative and fun, and the illustrations are colorful. Where is the PJ Library program currently available? We launched in Western Massachusetts in December of 2005, actually the location of the Harold Grinspoon Foundation. Uh, in February 2006, we launched in Shreveport, Louisiana. This month, we're rolling out in Detroit, Michigan. And then we have about 12 other communities which are in the pipeline, Boulder, Colorado, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Western Connecticut. Omaha, Nebraska, New Orleans, and then there are about 40 other communities that are inquiring about the program. It's really about helping people access their Jewish identity. Bali Cooks, thanks so much for speaking with us. Okay, thank you. If you'd like to share a page from your own book of life, or to express your opinion on our show about a particular book, CD, or video owned by the Feldman Library, email me, Heidi Estrin, at Heidi at cbiboca.org, or call our listener comment line at 206-888-2657. Just so you know, this is not a toll-free number. Our background music is provided by the Freylock Makers Klezmer String Band from Sacramento, California, whose CDs feature upbeat music from the Ashkenazic and Sephardic traditions with Brazilian, Gypsy, and Celtic influences. Borrow their CDs at the Feldman Library or buy your own copies at freylockmakers.com. To download episodes of the Book of Life podcast, visit us on the web at jewishbooks.blogspot.com. That's Jewish Books, one word, dot B-L-O-G-S-P-O-T dot com. Links to the books and CDs mentioned on the show are available on this website. Thanks for listening, and happy reading! Thank you.